Hello, my name is Tom Ayers, Senior Staff Writer for the Vermont Standard Newspaper in Woodstock, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Vermont Standard Time, a collaboration between Woodstock Community Television and The Standard. My guest today is Deborah Green, Executive Director of TEDx Heartland Hill. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's nice to have you here. So, yes. uh, TEDx Heartland Hill is gearing up for its second, uh, hopefully, annual um, event. Hoping, yes. This coming in September, this coming September 23rd. And we'd like to talk with you uh, at the outset here a little bit about the history of how TEDx came to Woodstock and Heartland Hill and uh, how that relationship with the, with the uh, international TEDx program works. Well, I was looking for a way to bring um, conversation to Woodstock mm -hmm. and to bring some speakers in. And you can start your own program, and it may take some time to get it going, or you can look to produce through TED. And um, I had had the experience of being an innovator myself at a TED conference at TEDx Marin, mm -hmm. and I could really see just how widespread those talks, you know kind of got out into the world and I thought that would be a wonderful thing to do for Woodstock. Mm -hmm. There are so many interesting people in Vermont and why not put them on a global stage as well, as well as getting people from all over the world that are really interesting and bringing them here to, this, to Woodstock. So it's a mix of people from elsewhere and people from the regional community in which you're Yeah, operating. I think the way to make it really work is to really commit to at least having half of our speakers being from Vermont. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then, you know, dabbling in the other people to round out the program rather than the other way around. Um, I think that that's kind of a special, I think, ho hopefully that's the right mix. But that's right, what I'm right. Now, TEDx events are, are organi organized around a theme. Do I have that correct? Yes. And, and is that theme suggested by the TEDx organization or is it developed locally? Once you are a licensed producer, um, you can create your own program. There are very, very specific guidelines mm -hmm. so that it fits within their programming. And anything you produce then goes through, you know, their system, which, you know, benefits everybody because their system is so global. So they can really take an idea worth spreading that's local and get it out really far. So I get to choose. I see. When you say it goes through their system, they actually distribute it as a program. Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. Okay. And over time, you build your brand, like TEDx Heartland Hill. Mm -hmm. um, usually what you do is you name it after your town. Mm -hmm. And when I came with Woodstock, I think, and I found out a year later, it was just Woodstock's such a cool name that they didn't give it to me when I went in for the licensing. Right. Yeah. And I think it's, they said, yeah, we're going to look at it in a couple of years, you know, that they wanted to make sure that I produced a high quality event before they gave me something as as great as the name uh, Woodstock. Sure. So sure. they recommended that I pick to pick a street or a hill and Heartland Hill to me is really meaningful because I I grew up in Boston and Heartland Hill. Mm -hmm. So and actually the house we lived in looks out over Billings Farm. So from Billings Farm you can actually see the house I grew up in as a kid. Mm -hmm. So I love the fact that it yeah, has absolutely. that history. Absolutely. You know, for me and personally. of course, Billings Farm and Museum is involved as the host site as well, right? And so, so many people, um, we make sure that we uh, do um, a survey afterwards. TED itself, the big TED, does a survey. Mm -hmm. And so many people really commented on what a great location it was because mm -hmm. you had the ability to have a really um, contained place to actually film. In their in their in their staged area, right, mm -hmm. and then also have these amazing places for people to interact after the talk, so they absolutely. can talk. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I presume you, you you filmed in in barn four there, in the big barn at uh, Woodstock. Um, the... We actually filmed in the theater. Ah, okay. So we had that a makes sense. Yeah, sure. beautiful yes, set, absolutely. very simple with with birch trees on either side, and it was um, you know three camera setup and you know mixed in the back but also then we edit afterwards. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. That first uh, that first TEDx Heartland Hill program was last September, yeah. is that correct? And what was the theme of that and talk a little bit about some of the highlights before we move on to the 2023 program. It was really um, it's so fascinating to, you know, to kind of go into something that you've never done before. You mm -hmm. know, I've produced things before but I've never done this. 
Right. And there's something about that red dot that, you know, the, um, every TED talk, there's a red carpet and the person, it's in a circle and the person stands on that circle. It's That's the common look mm -hmm. around the world. And there's just, it elevates it, you know, there, it's, it's really meaningful both to the speakers and to the people who come and watch it. Um, the first theme was community, what is community, mm -hmm. uh, which came directly out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. there's seemed to be a big question, not just up here, but all around the world, you know, how do we function as a community? How do we support each other as a community? How do we become inclusive when communities are changing so drastically at the time? I think we, we looked and there was, what, 450 houses that were sold in Woodstock proper mm -hmm. within that year and a half. Mm -hmm. That changes the community Absolutely. Uh, drastically and especially a community that's really built on, um, you know, tradition. So how do you marry all this new energy that's coming in mm -hmm. while really respecting the old? So that Absolutely. was really at the, the height of the conversation for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, this just occurred to me. Yeah. What does TEDx stand for? What What's the T? What's oh the God. origin of the name? Do you happen to know? I know. Yeah, and I'm blanking. But it's <laughs> technology, des education, and design, or yeah, uh, yes, environment yeah. and design. Yeah. 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 And okay. it, the the tag is ideas worth spreading. Absolutely. Okay. And that should be on the top of my tie, and it's just it's so not. <laughs> it's quite all right. It's yeah. quite all right. But it's funny when people talk about TED talks, and they're like, "Oh, I heard this TED talk." Oftentimes it's a TEDx talk because there are far more TEDx talks that are going on around the world mm -hmm. than the big TED conference yeah. that happens once a year. Yeah, I subscribe to the podcast. Oh, yeah? So, so I, I, I hear a lot of those. I wasn't listening to one on the way over here. I could have been. but yeah. um, um, So this year's theme yeah. is the art of living. And you've just wrapped up, I believe it was May 15th, mm -hmm. the application deadline for speakers, but talk a little bit about the theme, the art of living, and what uh, what that entails for this year. Well, one of the things that I, I, I want to bring up is that last year, it was the first year, so I kind of, and I, I done a lot of work around the world, so I was able to kind of pull from my own community and bring people together for it. This year, we have a track record, so we were able to open up for submissions, and we have had, I think it was 110 submissions, mm. um, maybe even a little bit more at this point, um, that came in for these 11, 12 spots. So wow. that was very exciting to me mm -hmm. to see the breadth of, of ideas that were coming forward. And I actually have an advisory board that works with me to kind of go through that to help build the program as well as you know, peppering it with other people that I want to bring in. So it's, again, mixing. And 110 people weren't all from uh, Vermont. I think there was maybe 30% of those came from Vermont. Mm. Um, and th the idea for the art of living feels like the next step after the pandemic, the next question that I kept seeing and hearing in conversation is this kind of, now what? You know, we all kind of had to reorganize our life Absolutely. and really consider things after the pandemic. There yeah. was a lot of loss, whether mm -hmm. it was personal, you know, of a human being or a job or a home or, you know, and and people were really contemplating, what do I, what's, what's a value to me? Yeah. Yeah. And so I thought that was uh, an interesting way of bringing it up to say, mm -hmm. okay, what is the value of a life? And um, what have people done that allows that conversation to be really meaty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, it was this. My, my wife and I often say to one another that the last three years have just been this surreal kind of existential limbo. And right. That, that, um, and it has, it has caused people to really rethink themselves, rethink life, rethink what's important to them. Right. And there's been this almost seismic shift in a lot of people's lives as a consequence of that. I, I so. feel like it's like a, a reshuffling, like a global reshuffling, right. you know, that's yeah. happening. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I, I'm really impressed with the things that are coming forward from, mm -hmm. from it. Yeah. yeah, so. um, yeah. You mentioned, we, we were conversing before the program began, you mentioned um, one particular speaker that you've already identified. And um, um, 
continuing to work through that selection mm -hmm. process. But uh, tell our listeners and our viewers a little bit about that. Uh, sure. Speaker. Um, the first one that we're announcing, and we're announcing it next week or here, um, is Agnieszka Pilat. And one of the things that we were trying to do when we were looking at kind of the subcategories of the art of living, and with, um, I mean, literally the last month and a half, AI, since mm -hmm. chat GBT came out, it's, um, it, it just grows and grows and grows exponentially. And there's, there's a lot to consider when you look at AI. And so we've had long conversations of how do we want to bring in AI because that's going to be part of the art of living moving forward. How do we balance technology that has so much intelligence, more intelligence than we are, into um, living a, a peaceful life? And is that possible? Um, and I really didn't want to go for just going after it technically. And the wonderful thing about Agnieszka uh, Pilat is she's a classically trained um, um, and schooled artist. And she's been working with Boston Dynamics and working with um, their first dog, a uh, robot dog was named Spot. And she has now, after working with them for a while, has been given um, two dogs. Um, I, I, Bess and I don't know the names, because both of them begin with a B. Mm -hmm. uh, and she paints. She's taught this robot dog how to paint. And the two of them paint together. And um, they just sold their first painting uh, through, maybe not their first, but it, the big painting was uh, sold at Sotheby's. Their first one that they did was sold at Sotheby's for $50,000 recently. Wow. And she's um, going to be uh, opening up in, at the museum in Melbourne um, this summer. And then she's going to come back here with one of her robot dogs uh, to speak to us and hopefully do a presentation and an example of what that is. And I thought that was a really nice way of, of, of starting the conversation about mm -hmm. AI and also kind of safe, you yeah. know, because yeah. it's a dog that you're yeah. anthropomorphizing yeah. as opposed to, you know, a human, a robot. human robot. And yeah. also that they're creating art. And she spoke to me about having, about her relationship with this robot. You know, and as she's talking about it in a, in a very uh, compassionate way and feeling way, she also acknowledged, well, at this point, it's very one-sided, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. um, but she also said, you know, that may change, that there may become a bond that's wired into their system coming from the other way as well. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that that's just down the pike, too. Yeah. Now, as a writer... Yeah. who has been paying a lot of attention to the writer's strike that continues yeah. and is ongoing, and particularly as a fan of, of sort of very politicized late-night television like Stephen Colbert and Bill Maher. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm really intrigued to hear what you're saying about uh, this artist because uh, writers feel very threatened yes. by the rise of AI, and that's at the heart of the writer's strike discussion Absolutely, right now. Absolutely, it is, should be. Is having... Um, having this, this robot, a computer, whatever it might be, uh, writing scripts, writing words that heretofore have been the um, province of wordsmiths. Um, and I think that's the thing that's so fascinating, isn't it? Like we originally thought about the robots as being able to take our factory jobs and you know moving box from here to here. I don't think anybody or most people weren't thinking about that they were going to take like the good fun jobs, like the creative jobs. Right. You know, I think exactly. that that's kind of a surprise to the general population. And I was actually talking with um, someone who runs a nonprofit and a fairly large one, and he's, you know, he was talking about his son who wanted to become a grant writer, and he actually now has coached his son and said not to be, because here's this man who runs a large organization and he's using. Uh, AI mm -hmm. to write his grants. Yeah, yeah. You and know? I can well imagine because I've been a grant writer myself in positions I've had in the past, mostly mm -hmm. in the nonprofit sector. Uh, and um, it's a very specific Tedious. kind of writing. Yeah. It's a very formulaic writing. Um, you, you, you could easily program software. Uh, the, the skill in it is knowing how to hit on all the talking points that are going to push the grant right. age, funders buttons, right? right? And that could easily be programmed into a, an AI. I, kind I, of. I mean, are we going to miss the heart? 
Well, are we going to hear the heart? That's it. Yeah. 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 I that's don't it. know. That's it. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's, a, it's certainly a topic for for uh, uh, more discussion. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Will you be rolling out the speakers over a period of time over yes. the course of the summer? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, it's very yeah. exciting. The group that uh, is already kind of emerging, and I think I'm not sure if I'm going to do them one at a time or if I may do a group at once. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because you, um, you mentioned over 120 applicants. Is that 110, right? but 110. I, I'm still got a couple that came in that I haven't put in through the process and, yet. And, and how did you do, do? You work with the the international TEDx organization to get the word out, to put out a call for speakers, or how does that Well, work? I mean, we did it through Vermont Standard. Right, uh, of We've course. done it through the listserv, um, and, um, you know, and through social media, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. through different organizations that way, as well as TED. Absolutely. So that was, Absolutely. you know, that's how it kind of got so out. So September 23rd. Yeah. 2023 again at Billings Farm and Museum. Uh, when will um, when do you anticipate um, um, ticket information and things like that becoming? Uh, um, um, because I'm, there's ticketing for the in audience yes. part, right? Yes. And then um, is there a live online component? You as know, well? I not we're not really allowed to do that yet. Okay. Um, but what there's. There's 200 tickets total that are available. Mm -hmm. There's 100 in, in the auditorium and 100 that's um, in the big barn with right, a huge barn TV. Barn. Um, and I mean, not TV, a um, screen. And last year, and that's how it is in most TEDs. Mm -hmm. And then as I grow, I'm going to be allowed to maybe have it at the, you know, have part of it at the town hall and or in a larger place where I am not going to be limited to the amount of people mm -hmm. that we can have. Mm -hmm. But there's the overflow space, which is what it's called, you know, the barn. It's always a different kind of experience because in the overflow space, people usually have drinks and they're talking and there's, they're available to get the food and to walk around while they're listening to the speakers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a more interactive space and some people really prefer that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I've gone to other TEDs and I prefer that rather than you know, being confined to a seat in the audience. At the same time, there's a, there's a, it's a huge difference being in a room watching a TED being filmed versus watching it online mm -hmm. because it's not complete. You have to edit it afterwards, right? You have right. three cameras Absolutely. going. And oftentimes, um, the um, speaker will lose their way or forget something, and they'll have to back up and start again. And so you're really kind of, um, you're really present at the filming of something as opposed to necessarily a perf finished performance. Right, Which, right. Um, you know, we had a, a number of really beautiful speakers last year, and, and one of them was, was a man who um, was speaking about um, uh, being sexually abused in, in high school mm -hmm. and at a boarding school. And it was really hard for him to get through it because he was talking about his victim statement a week before, 40 years later, a week before it just happened to be in this way that the perpetrator was being brought to trial. So it was a really powerful moment for wow. him. Wow. And uh, we, we really took our time pulling that speech together. And mm -hmm. his wife was sitting in the front row. And every now and then he'd lose his way. And, and she, he, she would give him a line. And he would start again. And it was this beautiful play between the audience and the speaker that was, you can't, you need to be there to have that experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or that something goes wrong technically, and then there's an interaction between the speaker and, you know, I mean, Leon had this beautiful, uh, Leon uh, Dunkley was one of our, our ah, speakers last yeah, year. Yeah. Beautiful, and he, and he uh, spoke about a little girl singing uh, a song, and and it was very, it was very sweet, and, um, the next person that was on was this really beautiful man, Tony McClear, who uh, was an ex-white supremacist and talking about how to make your way from hate, you know, from love to hate, then hate back to love, you know, and mm -hmm. what happened in his experience. And something went wrong technically, and he ended up on stage just waiting. And, and here's this moment where who knows what the audience perception or thought of what his speech was going to be, knowing mm -hmm. the topic. Mm -hmm. And instead, he took Leon's song and started singing this song. Wow. 
and it was just like changed the whole dynamic of the room. You wow. know, so you have these moments that you just you know you don't know about when you watch the speeches when they're done and perfect online, Absolutely. and you Absolutely. don't know the experience that you're having yeah. on stage. I, I primarily have the experience of um, of hearing the podcasts mm. oh, yeah. or of hearing them on public radio as right, well, right. and they sound seamless. Yes. I mean, they sound absolutely good. You, you, you would have no idea that maybe this person stopped and started and stopped and started multiple times because right. they just sound so relaxed and polished and fluid. So yes. it's, it's really, I can, under, I can appreciate how different that dynamic is when you see it in you, person. And one of the things that I really love about how TED structures it is they don't want you to have teleprompters and they don't want you to have <clears> any <throat> written word with you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important because it keeps the person uh, present. I mean, mm -hmm. you have to be thinking on your feet because you may lose your way, mm -hmm. you know, and not everybody's a professional speaker. And, right. you know, and the professional speakers aren't necessarily the easy ones, you know. It, it, and, and, you know, so you have a mix of level of experience that get on stage. And, and last year, being my first year, uh, there were a couple of people that I allowed them to put their... Um, speech in they you know really they were just really wanted it on the ground in front of them mm -hmm. and I was like oh, I really don't want to let them but okay you know everybody's nervous and and I let that happen and, and I won't do that again because mm -hmm. what happens is they 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 knew it was there right so they went to and so there was a lot you know so much of them they were looking down and looking for you know as opposed to finding your way by engaging the audience it, it creates a different dynamic absolutely. yeah absolutely well, this has been a, a, a really enlivening and interesting discussion. Um, how can people find out more? And we'll, we'll put this up on the screen sure, as well. Sure. Um, find their way to your website. What is that website? It's TEDxHeartlandHill.org. And the, there'll be ticket information there. Um, also, all of the speeches uh, from last year are there. So you could spend some time kind of looking through those mm -hmm. and, and familiarizing yourself just to get a sense of what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then there'll, there'll continue to be more information. Uh, we were looking to have an after party. Uh, so there'll be other events and other ways for people to be involved. Mm -hmm. And um, there'll be a lot of uh, local food and spirits and great gift bags and all of that Excellent. stuff. So, Wonderful. you know, we're, we're very thankful. Um, for all of our sponsors and specifically to uh, Woodstock um, EDC, Economic Development uh, Commission that gave us a grant the first year and gave us a grant this year. Yeah, that excellent. was very helpful. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Deborah, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, this year's TEDx and to continuing to keep our, uh, our viewers and, and listeners um, advised of what's going on as we get closer. I really appreciate that. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much.